Are you able to take the screen, she? Oh, hi. Um, to share the screen? Yeah, yeah, you can share the screen now and I'll do intros. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yep. Okay, great. All right, perfect. All right, welcome everyone to today's seminar. Uh, today we are having our next set of early career seminars uh, by Ji Lu and Connor O'Brien. Ji uh, Lu will be going first. Uh, she got her bachelor's degree in Shandong University in China in 2018. She is now a third year graduate student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, working with Dr. Wee Zhang on foreshock transients and in particular foreshock density holes. Her work right now is supported by the NASA Future Investigations and NASA Earth and Space Science and Technology Program. We're happy to happy, eh, pardon, we are happy to have Ji, Ji Lu here today. And with that, if you would like to start your seminar. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Hello everyone, I'm Xi Lu. And today I want to talk about our statistical study of foreshock density holes. And before I get started, I'd like to thank all co-authors here for their great help. Okay, let's get started. And here's the outline. I'm going to introduce the full shock shortly and show an example of the density holes. Then I will present our statistical results to show what characteristics do full shock density hole have and under what solar wind and interplanetary magnetic field conditions density holes are most likely to occur. After this, I'll show a classification for the density holes based on the observation to answer whether density hole is a unique full shock transient or not. Finally, I'll conclude with a summary. The sketch shown here is a Earth's foreshock region. There is a radio presentation that discussed it in detail. So here I'm only to mention the basic part. When IMF is parallel to the Bolshock normal, the incoming solar wind would interact with the Bolshock and some particles would be reflected and move upstream. The interaction between the solar wind particles and the bank streaming particles would make this region very turbulent and generate many full shock transients and waves. Today, we only focus on one of the transients named the density holes. Almost all our identified density holes are embedded in a full shock region. That's why we call them full shock density holes. Here shows an example of the full shock density holes observed by MMS1 in our event list. This event is near the subsolar region and is characterized by the depletion in magnetic field strings and electron density. For this case, the ion bulk velocity and the electron bulk velocity do not change much, and the ion temperatures have enhancements in the core region, and ion temperatures increase with the corresponding with the full shock existence of the full shock ions. Uh, in order to identify events like this, we used some criteria. First, the density depletion should be larger than 20%, and the correlation coefficient between magnetic field strength and the electron density should be larger than 0.5. To distinguish this structure to other foreshock transients, the duration of density hole need to be less than one minute. And to exclude the fast mode wave trains, we used a variable here. That is the electron density minus its average times the change of the magnetic field strength from its average. For isolated events like this, the variable minus its average and then divided by the standard deviation should be larger than three. And for events embedded in waves, this function value need to be larger than five. And for this event, the density depletion is over 
and the correlation coefficient between the magnetic field and the electron density is 0 0.89. The duration in the core region is roughly 14 seconds. And the function value here is close to five. Then we perform the statistical analysis to events like this we identified by using this criteria. The low dynamic pressure of density holes may disturb the bow shock and magneto poles and have potential geo effects. 411 density holes were observed by MMS1 from 2017 to 2019. The pink diamonds here represent the density holes we identified, and bl black curves are MMS1's trajectories, blue curves are estimated bow shock and magneto poles. The occurrence rate is 5.4 events per day, since the total time for MMS1 spent in the solar wind during this time period is 76 days. The occurrence rate on the downside which we refer to 6 to 10 MLT is 44.8%. And on the dusk side, which we refer to 14 to 18 MLT is 23.9%. And here are the characteristics of density holes. These nine plots show portions of events as a function of each parameter. The mean duration is close to 30 seconds. Mean electron density depletion is roughly 42%. Mean magnetic field strength depletion is near 35%. And we separate the photoshock ion energy distribution and the solar wind energy distribution to get the parameters separately. The middle two plots show the velocity used here includes both photoshock ions and the solar wind while the velocity used in bottom two plots only contain the solar wind. By comparing the flow deflection between the bulk velocity and the solar wind velocity and their flow deviation angles, we could say that the flow deflection are caused by the photoshock ions to some extent. And then we calculate the spatial scales for events with and without a discontinuity. For events without a discontinuity, we assume they convect with a solar wind and measure the scale in GSE X direction. And for events with a discontinuity, we assume they propagate along the bow shock surface. And most of our events are between 0.5 to 2 RA. Because almost all our events are associated with photoshock ions and they do have a clear effect to the flow, we want further to know how the photoshock ion energy changes inside the density holes and whether they are responsible for the ion temperature increase or not. So here we compared the photoshock ion density and energies inside the density holes and in the bank ground by removing the solar wind beam. The y-axis here is showing the parameters in the ambient and x-axis is showing the parameters in density hole region. All parameters here are for photoshock ions. It's clear that for most of our events, the photoshock ions increase in the density holes the bulk kinetic energies do not have a clear tendency for thermal energy, which is represented by temperatures. We could say that the perpendicular temperature increase for most of our events, while the parallel temperatures show in the opposite. So for some of our events, the photoshock ions do contribute to the ion temperature increase and density holes have almost the same total photoshock ion energy as a background. Now we are looking at uh, solar wind and IMF conditions, which may affect the occurrence rate of the density holes. These six plots are all have the same format. 
that uh, top panels show the events distributions and middle panels show the background distributions observed by ACE or from the OMINI database. And the bottom panels show the occurrence rates with a unit event per day. And the left top plot show that with the increase of the magnetic shear angle, the occurrence rate increases. The middle top plot is the core angle distribution and we could see there are two peaks uh, in the occurrence rate. And this may be because most of our events are in the flank region. And plus C to E show the occurrence rate is higher for the faster solar wind speed lower solar wind density and weaker magnetic field strength. A dependence of the occurrence on the density is due to faster solar wind having lower density. And the right bottom plot shows the geometry distribution. Theta Bn is the angle between the magnetic field and the Bolshock normal. Most of our density holes are embedded in quasi-parallel geometry. And this is beyond our expectation, saying that the small theta Bn is not the most favorable condition for density holes to be observed. This may be theta Bn is different at different bow shock locations. That means density holes could form upstream and propagate to the MMS position and experience a varying Bolshock orientation and theta Bn. Last, we calculate the angle between the convection electric field and the discontinuity normal for events with discontinuities. And the scatter shown here is the angle downstream as a function of the angle upstream. And we could say for most of our events, they have electric fields on at least one side pointing towards discontinuities. Till now, you may wonder that is density hole a unique type of structure or not, since the characteristics of density depletion and magnetic field strength depletion overlap with other force transients, or is it necessary to name it as a new type? So here, based on the characteristics of other types of force transients, we categorized our events to different types when they show similar features as those types. First, for hot flow anomaly, we show a typical example here. This type of structure usually has a significant flow deflection and are usually associated with discontinuities. Therefore, for our event, if they have magnetic shear angle larger than 15 degrees, bulk flow speed decreased more than 20% and ion temperature increased more than 20%, we categorize them to this HFA type. The same for spontaneous hot flow anomalies. The only difference between SHFA to HFA is that SHFA are not associated with discontinuities. So for our events, if they have magnetic shear angle less than 15 degrees and others the same as HFA type, we categorize this kind of events to SHFA type. For shock bubble is a structure that has a um, shock-like edge on the upstream side and they have a significant flow deflection as well. Fossil cavity is a structure embedded in waves without significant flow deflection. And fossil cavity is formed due to the fossil ions and the fossil ions do not appear in the ambient. Fossil compressional boundary as a boundary that separates the pristine solar wind and the region filled with photoshock ions. Here's our classification result. About two thirds of the events cannot be categorized as other types of photoshock transients. 
So we conclude that the density hole is unique. Now is a summary. Density holes are unique for shock structures and they prefer to occur on the downside with larger magnetic shear angle, faster solar wind speed, lower magnetic field strength, and in quasi-parallel for shock geometry. And density holes are characterized by the corresponding depletion in density and magnetic field strength. And they're always associated with for shock ions. The spatial scales of density holes are mainly between 0.5 to 2 RE. And there's no significant for shock ion energy change inside the density holes. Yeah, thank you. With that, I will take all questions. All right, thank you. Um, we have our first question from Eric Lund. Are these density holes in pressure balance? Uh, does the increase in ion temperature offset the decrease in ion density and magnetic field strength for the density holes? Yeah, that's a good question. And we could see the example here. Like, uh, actually we try to answer this question in our statistical study. But we made a problem here because uh, the ion temperature measured by MM is, um, is not that accurate because yeah, it includes the four shock ions temperature. So it's difficult to answer yeah, whether all of them are pressure balanced or not. Yeah, but for, but for this event, it looks like the pressures do not have much change. And so, but for, I think for sim, single events that we can do that, yeah, to separate the uh, for shock ions and the solar wind. And, and maybe you can see, although I separate the for shock ions here and show several parameters here, but it's like we remove the solar wind beam by remove the solar wind beam in the energy distribution. So that can be, um, ambiguous and um, so it's just for statistical studies. So yeah, so whether to answer this question, I think we need to test some single events. Okay, excellent, thanks. Um, so we have a follow-up question uh, by Jason Durr. Is there a preferential direction uh, that the density hole travel? Um, so here we just, uh, distinguish them in two directions to like to calculate the scales. Oh, but for travel directions, um, I think I think we need multi-observation to test this, like which directions they are going to propagate. But for events without discontinuity, I think maybe they can just convect with a solar wind. So yeah, that's our assumption. Uh, excellent, thanks. Um, so Krishna asks, are these uh, density holes associated with any kind of plasma waves? Um, for some of our events, uh, we do find them uh, embedded in waves because based on our criteria here, we still allow our events embedded in waves and they are not like some typical cavity town because cavity towns, like there's no, significant temperature increase, but for our events, yeah, like my separating criteria here, we still say there's some ion temperature increase inside our density holes. I think that's a difference. Excellent. Um, so I have a final question. Um, the more events observed on the Don flank, uh, you showed that related to cone angle. So do you think that's just a result of the geometry of the solar wind then? Yeah, till now we think maybe it's from the Parker spiral and let uh, uh, the cone angle like near the 45 degrees and this one's 35 degrees. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, if we have any other questions, we can come back to them at the end of Connor's talk. Um, so thank you very much, Yilu, for a wonderful talk. Um, our next speaker today is Connor O'Brien.
Um, let me get my windows open. Uh, so Connor O'Brien is a third year graduate student at Boston University working with advisor Brian Walsh. Connor studies the solar wind magnetosphere interaction on a global scale using novel soft X-ray imaging, such as the Cupid and Lexi missions, as well as investigating large in situ data sets via machine learning algorithms and other big data techniques. Uh, today, he's going to be talking about some work with neural networks and the Omni data set, and we're happy to have Connor here. With that, Connor, if you'd like to take over the screen, you can begin. Thanks for the introduction, Kyle. Here we go. Uh, wonderful. My computer survived the uh, screen share. Okay, so uh, yes. Hi, my name is Connor O'Brien. I'm going to be talking to you today about some uh, neural network models of the uh, near-Earth solar wind and magneto sheath. Uh, that we've been working on recently. To give you sort of like a rough idea of where we're going with this, we'll talk about solar wind propagation generally, then get into the specifics of our model, both the data sets that we use, as well as the model architecture that we implement. Uh, we'll go over some of the results of our model and some things that you can uh, take away from all of this. But first, of course, some background on solar wind propagation broadly. Um, I feel like most of us on this call have uh, wanted at one point or another to know what solar wind the Earth's magnetosphere is encountering right now or has encountered in the past. Um, what, how we uh, determine this, uh, it's not feasible to have a spacecraft parked just upstream of the Earth continuously. Uh, what is feasible is having spacecraft parked uh, in orbits far upstream of the Earth at the first Sun-Earth Lagrange point or L1. Um, these are spacecraft such as WIND, ACE, and DISCOVER. Those are our solar wind monitors at L1. So if you want a continuous record of solar wind conditions just upstream of the Earth, say you want to you know, run an MHD simulation with, uh, of a specific day or a specific event, or you, want to, you have some sort of geomagnetic activity that you want to say is linked to solar wind driving, the first thing that you have to do is propagate the measurements from the spacecraft at L1 uh, to uh, the nose of the Earth's magnetosphere, right? So there's lots of ways you can do this. You can imagine a uh, the simplest way is to just measure the velocity of the solar wind at L1 and then do a, a sort of ballistic or advective propagation to wherever you want it. Um, this is very simple, but uh, there are issues with this. This is These results here are from a large statistical study of time lags between IC3, a spacecraft at L1, and IMP8, a spacecraft in Earth orbit. Um, where instead of doing this simple uh, ballistic propagation, what they did was take a time series of measurements, these three uh, component, three parameters from each spacecraft, and then time shift them and calculate the correlation coefficient between them, find the time of maximum correlation, uh, and then uh, take that as the time lag. Uh, the histograms at the bottom are the difference between this calculated time delay and a simple advective delay. Uh, and what you can see is, is certainly some of the time, uh, it's great. There's, there's a big peak around zero, but there are also times in which it's not sufficient. Uh, by, by up to an hour, you can see, uh, it's, it's not out of the question uh, to have that time differ by up to an hour. So uh, you can obviously then say, well, yeah, we could, we could do just this correlation analysis and that, that should work great. Um, this works great when you have spacecraft outside of Earth's magnetosphere and you have spacecraft in the solar wind. And as soon as you don't have that anymore, uh, this becomes less reliable. Um, so what's more often used nowadays is a, a technique called planar propagation combined with minimum variance analysis. These are the underlying algorithms that do this propagation for the Omni data set, uh, which many of us are familiar with. Uh, the central sort of uh, assumption here is that the solar wind flow or structures in the solar wind flow are much larger than Earth's magnetosphere and much larger than Earth. So we can treat them as these sort of infinite planes called phase fronts sometimes, um, within which all of the parameter, the solar wind parameters are constant. You can then use a statistical technique called minimum variance analysis to determine the orientation of these planes. Then once you know the orientation of these planes, you know how fast they're propagating, you can then propagate those planes to you know, anywhere around the earth, right? And, and for Omni, this, this target that we're propagating to is the nose of an empirical bow shock model. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the propagation part of Omni. Obviously, the, there's, there's uh, Omni is not just this. <laughs> there's all sorts of wonderful things that go into Omni, like uh, 
uh, extensive instrument cross calibration between wind, ace, and discover, selection for which, which spacecraft that we want to use for any part of that data set, um, uh, data set cleaning, the spiking algorithms, and uh, I, I sort of breezed over minimum variance analysis, but that's its own art, uh, and Omni has their own very robust, uh, um, uh, robust form of minimum variance analysis. All that being said, uh, there are some limitations with uh, this algorithm in particular that then affect the Omni data set. So one of these limitations, in fact, the primary limitation identified by the Omni team is this thing called out of sequence arrivals. So say that you observe some phase front, we'll call it plane one with your spacecraft at L1. And then sometime later you observe another phase front, we'll call it plane two, um, oriented at some angle to, plane, to, to uh, the first phase front, right? Uh, say it's steeply inclined, uh, or maybe it's moving very quickly. Uh, either of these can uh, result in, once you do this uh, propagation forward to whatever your target is, you might find that plane two is predicted to overtake plane one. Uh, we know this is unphysical, right? There's no way that like a, a prior part of the flow can pass through a part of the flow and, and both of them uh, are, are unmodified by this. That, do, that doesn't happen. Um, so in the Omni data set, what you can do to identify whether this is occurring is when you download the data set, there's a, a, a parameter called delay time. And if delay time is negative, you know this is occurring. Um, this is you know, uh, one of the primary limitations identified by the Omni team. There's some other ones um, of, of varying importance, right? Uh, this, this procedure ignores processing from L1 to uh, the bow shock, right? So if there's any sort of anything happening uh, uh, in transit, as it were, um, the, uh, the, this technique can't capture that. Um, one other issue that you might take with this is it stops propagation at the nose of the bow shock instead of giving, uh, uh, giving these parameters at the subsolar magnetopause. The reason why this is done is because uh, it's very hard to determine from you know, upstream parameters what's gonna happen within the magneto sheet, right? Shock processing is very complicated um, and there's no sort of simple empirical relation for that. Uh, so um, even though we would like to know what's happening at the subsolar magnetopause, because that is what, where the energy transfer is actually taking place, right? Uh, however, all that being said, obviously Omni is still of great utility to the community and is a wonderful resource, right? Uh, here is a uh, example in uh, all publications in uh, space weather and JGR space physics uh, in 2020. That's some 865 papers, right? Omni is referenced in over a third of them, right? This is a uh, tool that's of great utility to our community. Uh, and this, this motivates this study in that, um, can we train neural networks to take data from L1 and spit out data uh, closer to, the, to Earth's magnetosphere and within Earth's magneto sheath um, in, in a way that uh, can go past these limitations, right? To address these limitations of the Omni data set and provide another tool that could be of use to the community. So with that, looking forward in that way, um, we conducted a sort of uh, proof of concept uh, study involving these neural networks uh, that we're going to be training on uh, input and target data sets. Uh, and we'll go over that now. So uh, neural networks and people bring up neural networks, obviously you need a lot of data you know, big data, right? Um, and in order to have these large data sets, we need to do something automated to assemble them. Uh, the way that we did this was uh, by following a technique from De Silva and colleagues, where they found that uh, if you're only interested in separating three regions, the solar wind, the magneto sheath, and the magneto sphere, um, these regions are actually fairly well separated in log number density, log ion temperature space. Um, and this is a figure from their paper showing this. Uh, and what they did is they trained a support vector machine to partition this space uh, into these three partitions uh, in a way that's you know, uh, computationally economical uh, and fairly robust. Uh, so uh, this is what we, we ended up using these partitions to assemble our data set of uh, targets. Uh, this was developed for the MMS uh, spacecraft. So we used data from MMS-1. We applied this classification algorithm to all MMS-1 data from 2015 to 2020. Um, one example on the right here, this is also an example that's investigated in that uh, paper by De Silva and colleagues, um, reproduced here with, with, with our, our sort of schema 
Um, and you can see the output of this classifier on the bottom here. Um, one thing to note is, is that, yeah, it looks, it looks pretty good. This is MMS crossing from the magneto sheath, crossing over the bow shock into the solar wind. And you can see, yeah, we, we start on the left on the, so the magneto sheath and, and the classifier predicts that well. And then we move to the solar wind and it correctly predicts that we're moving into the solar wind. Um, but its nature as just a partition means that it can kind of get jittery towards these boundaries between these regions. So you can see at 415, when MMS gets a little bit close to the solar wind, um, you get some spurious detections of the magnetosphere from this classifier. And similarly, even on a very clean transition, like the one by six o'clock, um, you can see that as it crosses over a little bit, you get a, um, a detection or two in the magnetosphere, right, as you move from one region to another. Um, so to avoid this, uh, what we did is we identified sort of stable intervals. These are intervals for five seconds from any chain, how small, or data outage uh, in, the, in the MMS data set, right? Um, once we've identified these stable intervals, which are highlighted in blue, uh, sort of example ones, it's not quite to scale. Um, we averaged 100 second segments of the parameters that we're interested in, the ion flow velocity, the ion temperature, the ion density, and the magnetic field. Um, and then after doing this averaging, we tag the targets with uh, time and position to get uh, this target data set from MMS. So, well, rather these two data sets, right? We could tell the difference between the magneto sheath and the solar wind. So we, so we split that up into these two data sets shown here. These are the positions of the data sets it's flattened into the ecliptic, or the GSC XY plane. Um, and it's great, a, a good amount of data, right? 200 and something odd thousand points in each data set, uh, roughly 50-50 dis distributed between the two. So that's excellent. We're not preferentially training one model or the other. Um, uh, and uh, in order to train these models, you have to split your data set. So we split each of these data sets into uh, chunks, uh, independent chunks, um, and assigned each to uh, training, uh, validation, and test data sets, 60, 20, 20. Um, in order to train our models to reproduce this data, we need some sort of input uh, for these models. And, and for that, we used data from the wind spacecraft. Um, during, this, during this time period, um, uh, wind had the best uh, sort of temporal coverage relative to ACE or DISCOVER, so it's what we went with for this data set. Um, didn't, decided not to do multiple spacecraft because I'm sure, as someone from the Omni team will tell you, doing instrument cross calibration is very difficult. Um, and it's not something we're interested in doing for this uh, analysis. Uh, each of these input data starts 130 minutes before each target and ends 30 minutes before each target. Um, this was done because we wanted it to capture a good deal of time history, but also the more time history you capture, the larger your input vectors are, um, which we'll, we'll get to why that might be an issue in, in, in a little bit. Um, we also position tagged with the average position of the wind spacecraft over the, each observation and added this, the uh, target position of the MMS spacecraft that we want to propagate to uh, for a total of 486 components in this big vector once you iron it out into a one-dimensional structure. So that's great. We have, a tar we have target data sets. We have input data sets. Uh, now we need to make a model to, to uh, uh, train to reproduce one from the other. Uh, and for that, we decided to use what's called a, a, a neural network or a fully connected neural network. And what that means or what neural networks are are collections of neurons. Uh, this is a neuron. <laughs> it, bears, it bears no resemblance to the neurons in all of our brains. Um, neurons are the building blocks of neural networks. And what they do is, is they take an input vector shown here as, as all these X's, uh, and then it takes the dot product with some vector of weights to get a scalar. It adds some scalar bias B. Then that resultant scalar is fed into some non-linearity non function uh, because otherwise we're just doing a bunch of linear algebra. And then the output of that function is the output of that neuron, which is also a scalar. This wasn't immediately, what wasn't immediately clear to me the first time this was explained, I wanna be really clear about this, is the thing that is optimized in these networks are these weights and biases, W and B. Um, these are the things that we're actually taking the gradient of and uh, uh, advancing step-by-step uh, step when we train our models. The model itself is called a fully connected neural network. And what it is, is it's just a set of these neurons linked in serial and parallel. Uh, it's the simplest class of neural network. Um, and it's so it, it was what we implemented for this uh, for this analysis. 
Uh, what it does is it takes that huge uh, wind input vector uh, on the left. This is not to scale. Um, it would be 486 components, and it takes you know uh, uh, the dot products and all the first layer of network of neurons, and then it, it uh, feeds it forward until you get to the output layer, uh, which is then the thing that you actually compare to your target data of MMS data. Uh, so all that being said, um, the specific model architecture that we used. I'm going to uh, speed through this a little bit just for time reasons, but basically we used five layers of neural, a five layer neural network um, to, and uh, we used industry standard procedures to avoid overfitting because these are very large networks. We need to be really careful about overfitting. Um, so we implemented dropout, layer normalization, and early stopping during training. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss these details, uh, but I want to get to the results. Speaking of which, uh, the results of training these models. Um, so here's sort of the, the mean absolute error uh, is what's, what's shown in this table here for the, uh, on the test data set for the magneto sheath trained model or neural network, um, the solar wind trained neural network. And then we also used Omni to get predictions for all of these MMS points as well and calculated the mean absolute error in the same way so that we could get a uh, sort of baseline reference. One thing to note here is that the sheath is looking at a different is is uh, uh, looking at a different test data set than the solar wind network and the Omni network or the Omni uh, predictions here. So while it's not directly one to one comparable, uh, you can sort of get a qualitative sense of uh, the sheet uh, network's performance. Right, um, the highlighted sections are the things that are looking at the exact same data. Right. So what we could see is, is that there are, even in this very simple form, these fully connected neural network, this fully connected neural network uh, does better than Omni over this data set uh, in terms of mean absolute error, right? Uh, especially on uh, the uh, plasma data, so the velocity and the density. Uh, furthermore, the sheath network uh, does pretty well. Um, its errors are higher almost across the board, but it is, it does have more physics to learn. And it's sort of a first of its kind um, uh, continuous record of magneto sheath conditions. Um, of course, uh, we all want to know how uh, the, these models perform in, in uh, sort of real world tests. So uh, here is a storm on May, 11th, on May 11th, 2019. It's not the biggest storm in the world. The DST was about negative 46, but um, what, it, what is nice about it is it was in our test data set, right? So, so the model hasn't seen this uh, uh, data before. Uh, so it's an actually valid comparison. And what we can see is, is that even in this very simple form, these models, uh, the, this uh, uh, fully connected neural network um, absolutely nails uh, the Z component of the magnetic field shown at the top here um, in a way that Omni does not. Uh, and similarly uh, outperforms Omni on dynamic pressure as well. Um, even though the distance, the uh, 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 difference is not as stark. Also, dynamic pressure here is calculated. Um, it's not just the, uh, uh, it's, it's not a component that is output by our model, but our out models output all the components necessary to calculate dynamic pressure. Cool. So all that being said, uh, what can we take away from this? Uh, what are our main takeaways? So even in this simple form, the solar wind train neural network predicts MMS1 data of the solar wind more accurately than Omni does. Uh, and furthermore, the magneto sheath train neural network that we have uh, shows good performance relative to the solar wind network uh, and represents a, uh, a, a sort of first of its kind continuous record of magneto sheath conditions, which I think would be very useful. Um, in the future, uh, one thing we want to do is adapt this model into an architecture suited explicitly for time series data. So fully connected neural networks can't natively handle time series data. You have to do this thing that we did where we uh, uh, sort of uh, ironed out time series data into a long one dimensional vector. Uh, and that results in very large inputs, uh, which means that the models are very unwieldy and um, uh, it's better to use an architecture suited for the task, right? So uh, that's one thing that we're going to be doing in the immediate future now that the proof of concept seems to work out so well. Uh, furthermore, I want to do some statistical analysis of the outputs of these models so that we can actually do, do physics, right? Um, so one thing that I, I think would be very interesting is to compare the solar wind and sheath model outputs to investigate Hello. shock processing in a statistical sense. Um, and furthermore, uh, to 
package uh, this model and its outputs in a form usable by the public uh, so that we can all benefit from this and use it as, as, a, uh, as, the wonderful tool, as a wonderful tool. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll take questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for a wonderful talk, Connor. Uh, we do have a few questions in the chat. Uh, the first one comes from Eric Winter. Uh, in the example you showed, uh, the neural network wasn't able to capture the transient at about 1845. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have an idea of why that might be? Right. So uh, it could be that this, so um, in order to look at why this happened, uh, my, guess is, my guess would be that that transient wasn't in the wind data that this model is being fed, right? So um, this is, of course, one limitation. If, if wind doesn't see it, our model can't uh, predict it. Or may, maybe it could interpolate over some things, but um, uh, you definitely don't want your model to be, to be overfitting. Um, so my guess is, is that wind didn't see this transient. Um, one, one way that I can say that also is if you note Omni, which is also pulling from wind data at this time, also doesn't see this transient. Uh, so that would be my guess. Excellent. Um, so Patricia uh, Reef has a question. Um, I'm not sure if it's in response to Eric's or as an additional question. Uh, the predicted fields you have for the sheath, um, they're predicted within the bow shock um, or was MMS outside the bow shock for these comparisons um, when you're calculating? I think it's when you're calculating the error in this column here. Is oh, MMS yes, the first the column here? MMS is in the sheath in this column, yes. Uh, so that column was calculated on um, the uh, within the sheath portion. Or the, we have two data sets, one of Omni in the solar wind and one with, or not with Omni, with MMS in the solar wind and MMS in the sheath. Uh, and this is calculated on the portion where MMS is in the sheath. Okay, yes. excellent. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Patricia. Um, so Paul Pickrell has another question. Um, that he says might be uh, too much, but I'll ask it. Um, so solar wind alphane waves and rotational discontinuities are known to result in pressure pulses in the magneto sheath. Are, do you know if the neural network model is able to capture these kind of physical phenomena? Um, so that is a great question. So uh, I would love to, this is part of that statistical analysis that I was referencing at the end, we're comparing the solar wind outputs and the, the uh, sheath outputs. Um, my, these pressure pulses are, I believe, uh, known to occur within for specific, uh, or more likely to occur for specific um, uh, solar wind conditions, right? So um, one could imagine that this, that actually certainly could be a thing that this uh, sheath model uh, predicts, but I can't say definitively one way or the other right now. Um, but I think that that could be very possible. Um, so Eric Winter has a follow-up question, uh, which is kind of anal an analogy, I guess. Uh, the neural yeah. network you're here is a mapper then, uh, L1 data in, um, magnetosphere data out, or the different sections of magnetosphere data out? Uh, yes. So yeah, it doesn't. Um, so one thing to say, I, I kind of sped through this because I was worried on time. But um, yeah, there one, there are two models. Uh, one is trained to take L1 data in and map it to uh, near Earth solar wind data on the other side. Um, and the other is trained to take L1 data in same or uh, uh, L1 data from wind in and then magneto sheath data out. Um, or magneto sheath observations out. So yes, in that sense, it is somewhat of a mapper. Um, the uh, yeah, neural networks are, are uh, strong interpolators. So yeah. Uh, so we have a question from Jason Durr as well. Um, uh, that is in reference to a talk, we an early career talk from Nathan Svitas that we had yeah. a month ago. Um, so you may, it, you may not be able to, if you didn't see Nathan's talk, relate. Um, but do the neural network suffer from the same issues that Nathan was talking about? Uh, namely, that they can overestimate um, certain parameters due to time uncertainty of the L1 measurements? 
Um, yeah, so, so this is referencing the same L1 measurements. So that time uncertainty is in play here. Um, one advantage that this does have over um, the, the techniques used for Omni that could alleviate that problem is um, that we are training to ground truth here, right? Omni, of course, invalidate, invalidating the model does train to ground truth, right? But here we are explicitly training to what MMS sees. Um, so if that, if that timing uncertainty is something that could be learned by the model, it could be optimized for, um, it could overcome that, right? Um, that's an excellent, that's an excellent question. Um, so I have a follow-up or a question with regard to the Omni error here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In your training, you only used wind data. Um, yeah. In the Omni data set, often there's a flag up to which data has been used. Have you looked at the MSEs or the similar errors here when Omni is only using wind? So um, this is, so it's, um, it just so happens that for our entire test data set, it is uh, wind that is used for Omni. Okay. Um, and this is because during this period, actually the, the overwhelming majority of Omni data comes off of wind because wind has, you know, uh, uh, great temporal coverage um, and uh, extensive calibration. So yeah, it, in, in this time period specifically, uh, it's almost all wind and we verified that actually over the test data set it's all wind for Omni here. Excellent. Um, and so my final question is, what library did you use for, neural, for your neural network? Yeah, I used Keras, uh, which is a higher level API for TensorFlow. Um, so it makes things a little bit easier and smoother to run, but under the hood, it's TensorFlow. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we don't have any other questions in the chat. Uh, so I'd like to take this time to thank Connor and uh, she again for two wonderful talks. Um, we do have a talk next week. Uh, John Coxon will be talking about a statistical analysis of Birkeland currents. So we'll hope to see everyone next week. And with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful week. Thank you again, Connor and Xi. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Really appreciate it.